just the ticket. The life of 91-year-old Percy Tucker, the founding father of CompuTicket, the computerized ticket-selling system for the masses pioneered in South Africa. It was born of his young man frustration in search of opera tickets on a cold Johannesburg night. It cost a million rand to set up a fortune in 1971. The money men were sceptical, but the operation soon had them queuing round the block for a box office ticket. Tucker, part entrepreneur, part impresario, also spent a lifetime mixing with the stars. From ballerina Dame Margot Fontaine, whom remarkably enough he got to perform Swan Lake in Zoo Lake in Johannesburg one rainy afternoon, more of that later, he also rubbed shoulders with actor Eartha Kitt and a very much younger Elton John. Welcome to this CNBC Africa special where we do like to celebrate some of the great entrepreneurs in Africa. In the studio today, I've got uh, one of uh, those with me. I have Mr. Percy Tucker. Now, he is the uh, guiding spirit and the founder of a company called CompuTicket. You probably all used it. I know I have where you can go and get a ticket from everything, from a rugby match to a show to anything in this town. It was his brainchild many years ago. And uh, here with me here in Johannesburg, and you tell me it's the first time you've been to Johannesburg. You're based in Cape Town for 17 years. Well, <laughs> I was bo born in Benoni in 1928. I traveled for, uh, I went to school in Benoni um, and then did my BCom at Wits University and my accountancy degree with uh, UNISA. And uh, in the, I worked in the, th there was the East Rand Theatre Club. Uh, there was an amateur club across the road. I lived in Princess Avenue right across the road, the town hall in Benoni. And they had all the top professional uh, producers and directors come out to South Africa. At, and to direct for them as an amateur company. But I worked there as a sweeper, as an innovator, as a stage manager, as a, a stand-in, a, a counsellor, any, anything you wanted, I, I did. Even I, I even sold the tickets. And uh, that was it. You were always, always, right from that age, you were about, what, when you started? 14, 15? And uh, you I were was 14, 14, I was 14 when and you I started, started up in the theatre. Theater. Yeah. And it was the theatre, that your love of the theatre, that took you through to business. You told me that the existential moment for you was when you spent three, was it three days and nights queuing well, for one ticket? In 1951, um, it was after the war, and you know, just, just before the, just after the war, African Sardinia Theatre started to bring all the big shows, the big musicals to, to Johannesburg and Cape Town. And uh, to get tickets, I had to get up at three o'clock in the morning and take the train from Benoni and queue up at a whole variety of places like Polyax and Publix and Boston's and Paramount stores. We never knew where the tickets were. But you couldn't buy them in Benoni because they uh, they never had a connection to Johannesburg. But in June 1951, um, sorry, August 1951, um, they announced that an Italian opera company is coming with eight operas, uh, with Benjamin Gili and Tito Gobbi as the stars, and I'm an opera fundry, so. I, a few friends and, and myself got up and we went and to His Majesty's at Friday afternoon and we put down the blankets and we slept there until Monday morning. <laughs> Comes Monday morning, nine o'clock, and the doors open and I go up to, I'm third in the queue. <laughs> I go up and I say, can I have so many seven, six, many tickets, please? And the lady said, seven and six, please? I'm afraid all the seats like, like that have been kept for the management. I said, you mean I've spent three days and nights outside and I'm getting nothing? She said, well, you can have the 42 shillings. That was a lot of money for a student. <laughs> uh, um, the next thing is I found myself on the stage. And I, there were at least a thousand people in the queue. And I stopped and I shouted to everyone, 
This is the biggest scam you've ever known. Mr. Stodel, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Avian Theatres, has no integrity and honesty. And how can he do this as people who've spent three days and nights outside on a pavement? I wish he could do it then himself. And then I left and found that uh, I was going, I went back to university for my lectures and nothing came of it. I don't know where the thought came from, but what happened is that in uh, a few months later, um, I saw advertise a theatre tour of the whole of Europe and to meet every big star in the world. So I joined Leonard Schock, the Cape Town director, and there were 14 of us, and we spent four months touring every country in the world and meeting everybody. But I still couldn't find where I fitted in in the theater business because I could, I had all the degrees, I could do everything, I cannot act and I cannot sing and I cannot dance, <laughs> so I was a total disaster. But then you decided to set up your own uh, ticket yeah, office. In 1954, Leon Gluckman, who was a fam famous director and he's won an Emmy Award, um, he decided he would want to do a production of King Lear and he said, Percy, will you be my business manager? And I said, certainly. Uh, I was still doing a at that time. And well, the problem is that when we started setting up the, the uh, office, we found that we had no access to publicity, PRO, uh, front of house, uh, advertising, uh, whatever a theatre office does, there was nothing like that in Johannesburg. So on August the 16th, 1954, I set up a, a little office in the 100 Elo Street down a long passageway for the queues uh, uh, at, uh, on the 16th of August, 1954. And it took off like a rocket, isn't that right, huh? Well, we opened with Emlyn Williams' uh, one-man show, which was quite magnificent. And every year got busier and busier. And then in 1956, I was given the contract for the Johannesburg Festival where the La Scala came and the Royal Ballet came. And, every, you, and orchestras, you cannot believe, for two months we had every top artists in the world here. And only the good thing is that um, Margot Fontaine came and everyone, every one of her performances was sold out, of course, weeks ahead. And we wrote to her and said, would she do another performance? And she said, yes. So we built on Zoo Lake. In the middle of the lake, we built a stage with the swans going around and she did second act of Swan Lake, except between quarter past seven and quarter to eight, it poured with rain. <laughs> and uh, the municipality were happy because they were insured. But uh, everybody got so wet and the, sh the, sh the show went on eventually. The orchestra was all wet. And I, I then had the cheek to go backstage and say, well, Moira, the, um, Margot, the crowds outside are like a, the, the cheers were like on a Rugby World Cup match. <laughs> and uh, Margaret, I said, would you think of doing the, the second act of the ballet again? And she said, yes. And well, you must understand that the cues for that, and then in 1959, the, the original King Kong, the cues went from Elof Street to from Brandis to Van Velich, right past the, what's it now, was the Joburg Sun and past the post office that just went on forever. And you made a lot of money in those early days. And how did that then become CompuTicket, the uh, well, operation that made your name? The 17 years we, we dealt with these queues and at that stage it was still parking in the centre of Johannesburg. So people came and parked in the streets and came to the queues. And I thought, this is crazy. I'm getting up at dawn to, to service the queues and I should be <laughs> an executive. So it, it became an obsession with me that there must, must be a better way of doing things. You cannot treat the public the way we treated them. And also you must understand that 
we had no branches in Pretoria or anywhere in Johannesburg. We opened a minor branch in Rosebank, uh, and but you had to pick up the phone and bend over the cashier and book the seats. We used to mark them with various coloured pencils. And for, for six, 16 years, we suffered like that, and the queues became very agitated, and I became almost hysterical because it's, there was just no solution. And then in 1968, I read about computerization, and I'd never heard of a computer, and I knew there were none in South Africa. So I got on a plane and went all around the world. I, I saw s people trying to do it, but nobody was success successful. I went to the Armisen Theatre in, in Los Angeles, and they were the nearest to doing it, but they could not get the supply of tickets because the theatre said, what we, why should we handle your tickets? We don't know who you are and are you going to sell? I didn't have that problem with show service. I, we were booking for everything. We had all the tickets for all the shows. So that problem didn't happen. Then in 1970, um, on the 31st of December, I learned that the Reed Paper Corporation was closing down a firm called SRS, which was tinkering with compu computerization of the entertainment industry. I took a plane that night to London, and six weeks later, 12 of their top programmers came from England. And funny enough, the these guys brought their families, they had a car, and they had uh, apartments, and their children went to school, and their salary was 200 rand a month. And they <laughs> thought that was very, very good. And that was 1971. Mm -hmm. And gradually, we, we opened with, we couldn't get anyone to actually um, sponsor us. Um, we went to um, a, a certain bank in Johannesburg, the, where we are bank, and uh, the, the managing director told me it's the most ridiculous idea he's ever heard, computerization of, of the entertainment industry. But these guys sat with me for seven months and we showed them all the various ways of, the, of theatre booking. and. On August the 16th, uh, 1971, exactly, um, was it 26, 27 years from, 17 years from the time that I started, um, we opened the first competitor office in, uh, in Elofs, in Jeppe Street. We had moved to Jeppe Street. Uh, Just give me an idea of how it grew, how quickly it grew in 1971 when you started Compu Ticket. Well, first of all, we, we didn't know what we were actually doing. Um, we had, we, uh, I decided to ask Stir Kinecore, who, who were two co separate companies at that stage, Stir and Stir, and Stir Films and, and, and Kinecore, and then they joined up as one that same year. And I went to see Dr. Vasana, who is the head of uh, the Sunlam Empire, and said, come and see what we are doing. And that's when they decided to put the money in to help me, because it, it, it started the cost structure to bring all the machines in to, uh, to, for the staff and everything was, and to also build the terminals was in the region of a million rand. That was a lot of money in 1971. <laughs> but <coughs> gradually over the years, uh, we, uh, we opened all over, we opened all over South Africa. Uh, we opened in Durban, we opened in Cape Town. Um, and when I retired in, on August the 16th, always my favorite date, uh, <laughs> in 97, 1994, um, we had like 500 uh, terminals around. We were booking for about 5,000 events and we never lost a client and we never 
disappointed, I think, anybody because I ran a totally honest uh, situation. We made a mistake, it was our mistake, we had to pay out. If we, anything happened with a, a performance, we actually guaranteed that the money would be, be coming to the, to the manor. And we met many shysters in the business, I promise you. <laughs> what were the problems you had, some of them, with the computer ticket? The problem was the, the, the programs. The programs lasted about six months and we had to change them. And eventually, in, 90, we, we, in 1954, 1971, sorry, we were at a place called Sigma Data, which was a, a computer room in the Saratoga Avenue in John Fontaine. And they had a three, uh, IBM 360. We then uh, were in partnership with T Tiger Oats, who owned the, uh, owned the uh, Sigma data. Tiger Oats said, we, I, I don't like computers at all. I, have no, I don't think there's any future for them, Mr. Frankel. So we went, they, he, sold us, he sold our share to Anglo-American and we went to Edelbond in Fox Street. We had a, it was bigger than this building mm -hmm. uh, with the amount of computers. And, then in uh, 1977, we decided enough's enough. We've had the, because when the system went down, the uh, gold mines were the first ones to come up. So uh, we were always the last ones and I, I was very unhappy. Mm. So we decided that we'll get, take our own programs across the road to our own computer room and we bought the first space shuttle mini computer to be brought into South Africa at Perkin Elmer and we worked on that until I retired and then uh, three years later the programs had to be changed again and the programs were updated virtually every year um, to, to deal with all the problems that came across all the, the, the uh, we, we were serving 300 people a minute uh, at, at, the, at the highest now they can serve, my God, uh, I think 67,000 people in about <laughs> 15 minutes. And this is long back before the internet and anything. How big were those computers back in the day when you started they compared were, to this room? Uh, there were about 16 massive machines in a, Edelbond in Fox Street is a whole block. And they, we took up the whole block. Um, then when we went on the mini computers, uh, the mini computer was much smaller and much more effective and much faster. Um, but the, the, uh, I must tell you a, a story about the, the, on the first day that we opened, we were selling tickets for His Majesty's cinema. There were, it, was, it was a cinema then. And we had to print off the seat plan and deliver it to them because they had no communication to us. And we put the guy with the plan on a bicycle <laughs> and the guy got lost and couldn't find his majesty. And I thought, here we are, we spent a million rand on computerized thing and the guy on the bicycle gets lost. So <laughs> gradually over the years, we introduced the, the, the theater to have its own machine to have, and then gradually we, open until eight o'clock or nine o'clock at night and then, um, and Sundays, uh, and now it's 24 hours a day. And um, uh, the, the volume is massive, massive, I mean. Uh, Looking back on it all, um, yeah. And the economy now, uh, what, what's your feelings um, just looking back on it and the way well, the economy has gone since then? See, we, in the 1970s, it was okay. And then, of course, Kirzner opened uh, Sunset in 1979, which made enormous difference because my cousin Hazel Feldman, who was the entertainment director at Sun City, uh, she um, started to bring 48 uh, of the top Hollywood stars out and that was enormous amount to us. And then in 1985 the boycott started and of course we just fell apart and um, Sol Kersner decided he's going to buy all the cinemas and all the adjacent companies and including Compuniget. 
And we thought, how, how can we find a way of, of doing business with uh, the th no one coming into the theatres, boycott of the, of the uh, um, playwrights, etc. So we decided that we must start selling bus tickets. And the city line decided that they, must, they were going to go to Cape Town, but they had no way of selling the tickets. And a bus ticket, they had 14 stops, and therefore, you could, 14 people could get out and 14 people could get in, so we had to sell each ticket possibly 14 times. So it was a total different uh, uh, approach for us, but the buses saved us, absolutely saved us until 1990 when um, the clerk uh, um, got done away with all the, the uh, laws. And then in 1991, you cannot believe, I think we had 16 Russian companies. We'd never seen a Russian in South Africa. <laughs> uh, and suddenly 16 companies, they came, the army, Red Army came, and the dancers and the ballet. And it was ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous, but it, it put us back on our feet again. And, and then we started selling, we'd really so, so, sold soccer for about 20 years. And you know, you could sell 70,000 seats in the space of a, few, of a few hours. We opened in Soweto, of course, and um, Alexander, and the capacity was just enormous. And then in, um, when, when I retired, one of the last things I did was uh, arrange for the public uh, entry into the uh, presidential election of Mandela. Mm. Uh, but, uh, I, I still am very lucky at my age, 91, that I'm still involved in the theatre. I've been on the Cape Town City Ballet Board for 14 years, and um, I still get invited to every opening night, which is absolutely marvellous. <laughs> and lastly, very briefly, looking back on it all, your career in the theatre and as an entrepreneur, how do you feel? I don't know. Sometimes I, th I look back and I think, well, I'm now a customer. So I sit at my desk at midnight, I look at the plan, I book my tickets and I print them at home. And I think, how, how has that progressed from getting up at three o'clock in the morning and standing in queues for three days and three nights? And um, you, you, the business you built that's a household name in South Africa, how do you feel about that? It's 48 years old now and I just hope that I'm still around when they celebrate their 50th year. Our main problem was that we had to pay rental to every shopping centre and keep staff for lunch hours, for leave, etc, etc. And now it was t taken over by three companies that eventually sold to ShopRite Checkers. And they didn't have that problem because they have all the uh, outlets and they have all the staff. So that just took a massive amount of uh, expense away. And so sometimes I get a little um, worried about some of the service uh, uh, that it carries on compared to, we used to take the, the the staff to the theater. We used to show them what the theaters looked like, etc. Nowadays, that sophistication and uh, involvement is gone, but the company is still, I was there yesterday, uh, first time I've been back for 25 years, <laughs> and it was lovely to see the new staff and the new system that they have, and it still has a great future. Thank you very much indeed. That's um, Percy Tucker the uh, founder of CompuTicket, a man who spent his life in the theatre. He's 91 years young, he's living in Cape Town, and uh, that was basically the story of how uh, CompuTicket was born because of a long queue back in the 1950s. Fred, that's all we've got time for on the CNBC Africa special. From me, Chris Bishop, it's goodbye. <laughs>